Now, it is said uh, somewhat glibly that the Bears don't build mansions on Fifth Avenue. Uh, that may be true in some trivial literal sense, but uh, Mark has built himself a, a chicken farm in Northern California. Uh, that is his heart's delight. And uh, uh, Mark is, uh, well, is uh, well, he is a short seller, short seller, and an analyst, analyst. Um, Having him here is a little like having Sandy Koufax turn up at spring training. Uh, uh, you know, I, I asked uh, Herb Greenberg, uh, whom you know, seen on TV, and he's a fair analyst himself, uh, about uh, about Mark. Who uh, Mark is, is Herb's hero. He's a hero to many of us. And here is what um, uh, here is what uh, uh, Herb said. He said. Um, uh, that uh, there's nobody so intuitive as Mark that uh, uh, in 30 seconds he can understand a story or tell it. He can get to the essence. And I've seen this myself over the course of, uh, I guess, many years. And um, uh, so, Mark, uh, what don't you like? Please come here and tell us about it. <laughs> I even, I even brought a prop. As we say, let's roll the videotape. OK, so you're an investor in Valiant. Yep. A short seller comes out and puts this report. You obviously read it. You yep. see this, the share reaction. Yep. After you've read it, uh, do you not believe it or do you not care? How do you approach it? So so we, we try to approach it the way good journalists do it, which is we, we try to do some fact checking right off the, the get-go. So the first thing we try to do is credibility of source, right? Is this person who's making this claim operating in a regulated jurisdiction? Are they in a regulated industry? Do they have anybody who has oversight? What if this person is making these claims, who, all, who, who is he, he, she accountable to? So in the case of some of the people who, who've been getting a lot of playing time, uh, they're completely unregulated, right? Uh, so, so, so that makes us immediately skeptical. It also makes us frustrated when we see how much how much airtime they get because because uh, they're basically being given e uh, equal stage with people who operate under highly regulated uh, uh, circumstances, whether they're accountants, CFOs, fund managers, etc. But this isn't the first person to uh, have a desire to short and valiant. Many people have. They've just been wrong. Right. He's the first person in a while to actually uh, say something and have That's the share fine. price but, go down. Like you mentioned James Grant. Then get James Grant on the show because James Grant has a certain accountability. But this man, has, this man uh, we're talking about, has alleged a fraud, right? And there's been virtually, up until uh, yesterday, there's virtually no fact checking on this person, right? This also wasn't, this isn't the first uh, bear raid that this, this man has staged in Canada, even in the last three 30 days, and and yet when you when, you, when we start checking out the facts, there's no pushback because because this person who's unaccountable, whenever you say something, this per, so the so the company or the accountants or or highly credible fund managers can, can say one thing about the company, and then this guy who, who, who who's, who's beholden to nobody, right, um, can get, gets gets equal weight in coming back on the argument. You brought up uh, James Grant. James Grant last year right. uh, in 2014 wrote that he's concerned about the account and that the accounting masks when right. sales are actually made. Something similar to what Andrew Left is saying. Regardless right. of what they're saying, you're an investor, you're long. Are you comfortable with the accounting? Do you feel yeah. like you know yeah. when things are being yeah. done? No, I, I'm comfortable with accounting. Bill Ackman has said publicly he's comfortable with accounting. Uh, James Kramer on CNBC has said he's comfortable with the accounting. Um, uh, uh, Ken, uh, the, the guy that uh, runs Costco, said he's comfortable with the accounting. Right. But what we're all seeing is uh, in this attempt to play up a story, to get a really good story on the air that's very, very compelling, is Main Street is getting absolutely crushed by this. So the guy out, so Valiant is now bouncing back today. It's up another 8 or 9% today. But that guy in Saskatoon, or that guy in Nova Scotia, who sold the stock yesterday uh, at a deep discount to what he paid for it, he's getting absolutely crushed by this. And, and, and part of the reason he's getting crushed by this is because these, these people who, who, who create a, a panic in the marketplace are being given all this airtime, and, and, and nobody's Checking the facts behind these people. Let's play the next one.
Welcome back. We've got two big stories that start with a C. We're going to start with Concordia first. Big, big action yesterday. Absolutely. There's been a lot of big action in this stock for weeks now, Francis. It has been on the negative side of the ledger. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, and you and I can chat about that in a moment. But yeah, yesterday afternoon, after the stock got annihilated again in the morning, based on algorithmic uh, based short selling, which I can comment on in a moment, the stock was halted and uh, the company ultimately put out a press release later in the day confirming that they are in discussions with potentially interested buyers of the company. I'd like to show you a table of a few comments that I think are worth highlighting. So the press release talked about them having formed a special committee. I found the wording on the press release a little confusing, so I confirmed with the company this special committee was put together weeks ago. It was not put together yesterday. Now, if you look at the shareholder list of Concordia, KKR, Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts, is a shareholder, a little less than 5%. Blackstone is a shareholder. My understanding is the company is in discussions with several parties. Blackstone is purported to be the leading suitor. And of course, let me declare right up front that my hedge funds at Forge First continue to be shareholders of Concordia. Now, what's the stock worth? Well, when I look at peer group valuation analysis, let's say a dozen U.S. companies, I'm excluding Valiant, uh, these stocks trade at 9 to 10 times enterprise value to EBITDA. EBITDA is a measure of operating profitability. Enterprise value is the net debt plus the market capitalization of the company. This is the trading value, not the takeout value. If I apply that 9 to 10 times EV to EBITDA to the shares of Concordia, I get 50 to 60 Canadian dollars. So it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen here. You know my position on the company. Now, the stock has been under attack from short sellers for a few months now, inappropriately painted with a valiant brush. But let's forget about that for a moment. You know, there's two phrases on Bay Street. There's pump and dumps and there's short and distorts. Now, if you engage in a pump and dump where you collude with people, you write research report, uh, you it's a bullish research report, You've prepositioned uh, your fund or your own position in the stock, and then you sell shares into the stock going up. Frankly, that's illegal. You can go to jail. Bottom line is short and distorts are not illegal. It's very gray. I think this company has been a, one of several Canadian companies that have been targeted for short and distorts. Weekly, tonight. We're going to talk oil with Richard Mallinson from Energy Aspects of London. Uh, he's bullish on oil. Tune in tonight at 5.30 at 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock Eastern Time here on BNN for Weekly with yours truly. And you have a good weekend. We'll see you next week on Morning Call. And good morning, everybody. That's, I figure that's a good way to start it all off. So that's what I'm up against in Canada. We got Jason Donville and we got Andrew McCreef. And here's a picture of someone posted on Twitter, the SS Concordia, with its fearless leader, who happens to be suing me for defamation and libel in Canada. A little more on that later. Um, and the poor rat bastard was hit with a margin call a couple weeks ago, so he had to sell another 865,000 shares of stock. So. Too bad for him. So, so, so anyway, some people spend their money on publicists or PR. I don't have a publicist. I don't have a PR firm. I like to spend my money on lawyers. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not necessarily an elective thing, but it's, it's, it's kind of uh, the cost of doing business and what happens. Although I'm a civilian, I don't have a fund anymore. So my lawyer said before I pop off at this thing, I should say a few things. Um, number one, I'm a defendant in a lawsuit filed in Ontario where the CEO of Concordia is suing me for defamation and libel. That's one. Two, I manage only myself, my money and my son's money. I get paid nothing from any fund. I'm not a consultant of any fund. I have strong opinions, which I will voice today. What I say, I mean with no malice. I may hurt people's feelings, but that's just part of life. 
and comes with free speech. But I don't mean any trouble by it, but I'm troubled by a lot of things that are going on. And I'm glad that you invited me here to at least speak my mind. My, my mode of communication these days is Twitter, so that's 140 characters or less. So it's, it's good to have a bit of a runway. So in terms of the first thing I want to really talk about is, is free speech. And free speech, to me, isn't free unless you're a bull. I mean, we live in a country where it's OK to sit down when the national anthem plays or protest the national anthem or this, that, and the other. But if you don't have an opinion that the Cartoon Network, AKA CNBC, uh, believes in, um, you, you don't necessarily have, have rights. So anyway, back in, I think, uh, April, I was invited to speak or be interviewed on BNN, which is the Canadian version of CNBC. And that day, Concordia was having its annual meeting. The stock at the time was 30 US, just for argument's sake. It's now trading at five. Um, so they've had some troubles. So the, the CEO, the guy riding the good ship Concordia, called me out at a meeting and he said that chicken farmers' chickens are going to come home to roost. So that's how that interview started. And they said, how do you respond? I said, well, he should focus more on his business, which is going down the drain, than on me. And I said he used to work for a fraud, which was BioVail, which was a proven SEC OSC fraud. And I'm tired of his nonsense. So nothing really happens. The stock's 30. He's for sale, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I live on a farm. It's not like a Green Acres farm. It's a nice place. And I have my house where I live with my wife. My son lives on the property. And then I have like an office in the back. And I'm doing something with my son. We're messing around and it's 9.30 at night and I hear some commotion outside. I guess there's a process server hanging in the bushes looking, this is, I can't make this up, look in the bushes, looking in the windows, looking for me. So my wife comes out and says, can I help you? And he says, yeah, I'm looking for Mark Cahotas. And she says, he's not here. And he says, I have something for him. And she says, what are you doing snooping around here looking in windows? I could have been taking a shower and walking around here naked. And he goes, well, you're ugly. Why, why in the hell would I look through the windows at you naked? And then she told him to get the fuck out or she'll call the police. <laughs> you know, my, my wife is Spanish. She's feisty. She's a lot of things, but ugly she's not. So she told me this, and I said, those stupid motherfuckers. You know, what the hell are they doing? So this, this is the great letter that this douchebag had to serve me. I, call, I, called, I called his card and said, you know, you made a huge mistake. You know, you don't threaten me, my son, or my wife. And, and this was just a letter that they wanted me to apologize. They wanted to, me to retract what I said on BNN which I wasn't about to do. And I figure if, some, if this clown wants me to do something, obviously I'm under a skin. I better talk five times louder, longer, and more fierce. And I kept going, and the stupid rat bastard sued me. So he sues me, and the stock is essentially 20. Um, the Wall Street Journal published the suit and the whole thing, and a week later, the company literally blew up to fucking bits. I mean, they had horrible earnings, CFO leaves, write down, first margin call, the whole thing. You know, and it's look, goddamn, you know, I'm a serious guy, and when I have a point of view, don't threaten me, don't try to quiet me. Don't try to threaten my friends. Don't quiet anyone. People are entitled to have a point of view. And you know, I'm fighting this in Canada. 
you know, it'll probably get thrown out. I'm going to try to make it expensive for him to get thrown out because I'm going to sue him. But by all means, this free speech thing is very important. And I feel really strongly about it. And I think it's, it's sadly, it's dying. Um, the markets, whether you like me or not, whether you agree with me or not, or my friends or people who do this kind of work, the markets are better to have free speakers around. You need a yin and a yang. You need a point and a counterpoint. The people who have spoken out on certain things, whether you're a blogger or an individual or a hedge fund guy, which those, those are few and far between now, they've saved situations or people's lives and things like Insys, who sells that drug substance which kills people. Roddy Boyd and I call her Dean of the Russian at CNBC have done a bang up job exposing that. Subprime lending, Sino Forest, Enron, some respects Tyco, for-profit education, Valiant, prescription drug pricing. I mean, in a frictionless pond, all this stuff would just keep going on, going on, going on, on. But the role of the markets, if they're free markets, which I don't think they actually are right now, you need free speakers, bloggers, and people like that out there. You know, when I was preparing this thing, I was thinking, what the hell would have gone on if Theranos was actually publicly traded? I mean, it was a complete and utter shit show. This thing is a private company. My lawyer also said I can't use dead end words like fraud, so I won't. <laughs> right? He, 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 he says, don't use words that have a defined meaning. Use, use, you know, use, use words like irregularity, nonsense. I said, well, I got fucking sued over saying nonsense. He goes, well, you know, there's only been two defamation cases in the history of the world where nonsense has been used, and you're now three. So, so I, I, try, I try to use, and I will try to use these bendy words, unless someone admits that they're a... Uh, F-R-A-U-D, so bendy word. So, I mean, this Theranos is a perfect example of a God-fearing man like, like Carew at the Journal, who, by the way, cut his teeth on Learn Out and House, be more on that a little later, but he, he uncovered something that's really bad. And maybe Theranos cost people their lives, but he sure prevented a lot of nonsense from sort of going on in the future. So to that, I really applaud him. And on Twitter and in the markets where I find people, information, things like that, because again, I'm, I'm kind of a part-time. I do this for fun. I'm genetically mutated and something's wrong with me, so I can't get this out of my system. So I, 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 keep, I keep doing it, even though Although I'm 56, I've aged in dog years some years, so it's 56 times seven. You know, I get this weird phone call from the attorney of something called BOFI, which is, I call Bank of the Islands. I'm not involved in the stock. And the attorney wants to know who all these people are who are bad-mouthing them. I said, I don't know. Um, you're best to just sort of leave them alone. And they said, well, can we pay you to consult for us? I said, no. I said, well, would you have lunch with Garibrandt? I said, no. I want nothing to do with you. Just, just let these guys do their thing. You know, let them just say what they want to say and, and prove it on the field. But whatever you do, don't sue them. So sure enough, they send subpoenas out to a bunch of people. Not me, thank God. My legal bills are high enough. And, and but, um, you know, again, people, don't, don't do this. If I owned a stock that tried to go after a skeptic, I would sell the thing on the spot, I'll tell you that. So in some, in some ways, and I was talking to Jeff Matthews before this started, skeptics and or short sellers or people who ask, ask difficult questions, I almost feel, and I'm serious about this, that we're sort of playing Negro League ball, that, that, there were some great Negro League ball players back in the day, and everyone can name Satchel Paige, and maybe some people can name Larry Doby, 
but I've been doing this professionally since 1982 for investing. And I've met a lot of people. Great, I've met all sorts. Still with us, not with us, this, that, and the other. But some of the greatest investors I've ever met are the shorts or the skeptics. I mean, names that no one here you know, would ever have heard of. Jim Carruthers, Phil Timian, the Bardens, Dave Shalley, Bill Fleckenstein, Todd Fernandez, Ely of Drawer, Eduardo, Tim Rice. And, and it's mutated now because it's so damn difficult to where, you know, the bloggers are taking over. And I think this free speech thing is so important and where I'm, um, I'm not sad, but where I'm frustrated is I'm not going to be sort of speaking out forever. I mean, maybe those poor guys in Canada will shoot me one day or something like that. But, you know, you can't let this kind of thinking or this way of life die. And, and to me, it's a problem. And I think that, you know, the market should be free. I think everyone should be treated equally. I think that is not the case. And I think that's a, that's a problem. This concept about short and distort, bear raids, this, that, and the other, it's just complete and utter bullshit. And I kind of blame my dear friend, and he's a troublemaker, this Lanny Davis, for, for perpetrating this. I kicked his ass in Learnout and Housebee, kicked his ass in Novastar, kicked his ass in some subprime deals, kicked his ass in for-profit ed. I mean, these people have to stop putting through and forwarding the notion of shoot the messenger dead without even listening to the message. I mean, some people send me clips of BNN where Joe from Saskatoon calls in and says, I bought Concordia at 50, it's now at six, what should I do with it? And the stupid guest who put him in the stock says, hmm, we sold it, we're very disappointed with the quarter, the market's telling you something, you should probably move on. I called up the host and I was so like sickened by it. I said, can you get me that guy's name? I'll just send him what he lost because I feel so damn bad for him. And I said, Amber, who was the lady interviewing Donville, I mean, you guys need to cut this both ways because these unsuspecting folks who listen to all this tout and all this bullshit on TV, they're just gonna lose their ass. And that's, you know, that's just not good. That's not what it's about. So, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff over time. I can remember t taking great TV star Kevin O'Leary when he was running the learning company, AKA Softkey, back when we were allowed to show up at conferences in closed doors, when he would tell me how he would buy this piece of junk and this piece of junk and that piece of junk and dust people. You know, I said, what's dusting people? He goes, we fire them. Well, you know, we just bought Compton's. We'll fire 350 people and leave it with five. I said, what kind of business is that? He goes, well, we'll put the encyclopedia in a box of Cheerios and it will sell. I said, you're out of your fucking mind. It'll sell. You know, he drove that thing completely into the ground. And if not for Bain giving him money, he would have gone flat broke before he blew a hole in the side of Mattel. I mean, there's, there's all this stuff over time, and in the slides that I'll show shortly, history you know, just doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So in my mind, there will always be room for idiosyncratic shorts. Um, it's a very, very, very difficult way of looking at life. But again, I can't, I can't help myself. I don't quit. I don't give up. I, I always say it's harder to get beat when you don't quit. It's harder to get beat when you don't let go of the rope. I would rather take the rope and kind of wrap it around someone's neck. And, and again, part of the process that I've enjoyed over time is when I first started out, you know, people who meant a lot to me and who helped kind of shape me, and that's either good or bad. I don't know whether people should blame them or pat them on the back. You know, there's a guy, Al Jackson. He was an analyst at First Boston. I look up to him to this day. There's a guy, Paul Andini, at the Northern Trust. 
when I first started there, him and I used to go out at night and count coin drop at the coin drop arcades. This is when the pinball machines were going out and video games were coming. And you know, I'd like to help the young guys coming up through the ranks who think like this. And if I can sort of help them and impart a little wisdom in their life the way some of those people have helped me, that would be a, a really good thing. So I don't think necessarily you guys are here to hear about all the past. We might as well talk about some stuff going forward. This is Network Associates, where I was sort of known for throwing the penalty flag at that clown Larson because he wouldn't take my question in a meeting. Um, the numbers were completely made up. We were never able to ask the guy real questions. And I showed up at a Robertson Stevens meeting, and I had a referee shirt under my regular shirt, sat in the front row. He answered everyone's questions except for mine. I kept my hand in the air like a gentleman. And he said, um, does anyone have any more questions? And everyone's laughing. So I throw the penalty flag at him, rip off my shirt. There's a referee shirt under there I call foul. I asked him the elephant in the room about his accounting, and no one said anything. Everyone was like, you know, let's take this fight outside. And then shortly thereafter, the thing blew to smithereens. I think the stock went from 66 to eventually four. So I wasn't afraid to mix it up then. I'm not afraid to mix it up now. So I had the good fortune of being involved in Valiant this year because of my friend Mike Crin Savage, who I think is the best farm investor on the planet. And I have a dear friend in Canada who alerted me to Concordia, but I sort of knew what it was. But I'm going to talk about the version 2.0 of Valiant and Concordia today. And they happen to be from Canada. So although no one was around, I think, or alive to see me with the referee shirt. Hold on. <laughs> I'm now putting on my Canadian gear. OK? So there's no more Canada. There you go. So we're going we're gonna to start talking about Canada. And the names I'd like to discuss are Home Capital Group, symbol HCG, and Trades in Canada, the Equitable Bank, Equitable Bank symbol EQB in Canada, and Entertain, which is Canada's version to me of Learnout and Housebe. Uh, that's symbol IT. Uh, home Cap's about $2 billion, Equitable Bank about a billion, Entertain about $800 million with a crap load of debt, and they owe more. So HCG has admitted to mortgage fraud, exactly 1.9 billion of origination fraud. They pre-announced in July of 15 the first cockroach. And they totally missed numbers. No mention of firing brokers. Then on October 29th, we have what we would call the roach infestation. The OSC shows up. You know, business is falling apart. The whole, the whole nonsense. So this is where it gets sort of good. Who are these so-called fired brokers? And after this uh, presentation, I have a 98-page PowerPoint on HomeCap. I have a 20-page 20 uh, 20 PowerPoint on Entertain. I have something on the Canadian regulatory regime, which includes staging. And I have a friend's uh, letter, Seth Daniels, who writes about Canada. And if you think any of this is intriguing, you should probably give him a call. Because if I'm right on Canada, he'll hit the ball out of the park. So this Corinne Cashal, according to the Financial Post and her handlers, was fired by HCG uh, in the great mortgage fraud to do, which, by the way, in Canada, they call soft fraud. She's tied with the now, with the then president, now CEO of HCG, Martin Reed, who happens to be the only bank president I've ever known who actually wears an earring. Nothing against earrings. I've just never seen it on a bank president. And, <laughs> and, 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 
and, and, and that kind of stuff, as Herb would say, I've been doing this long enough when I see a bank president with an earring, that kind of turns me on. <laughs> not, not in that kind of way, though. Uh, here's the head of uh, mortgages, Pino, with Corinne Kashal. How he still has a job is beyond me. So this is at her great awards uh, banquet. Wait a minute, I got a... Okay, HCG raised over $100,000 for her foundation. The relationship goes back to 2011. They were a big sponsor in 2012. So here's where it gets good. So this goofy rat bastard, Rizwan Karishi, he, he worked at HCG. I think if you look at his bio, he's a mortgage underwriter, but he was compensated on the amount of business that he did. And the mortgage origination fraud, and I can use that word because they describe it themselves, according to sources who used to be at the company and people familiar with the matters, allegedly began in January, February, March of 2014. HCG didn't admit to it and used various excuses in, 2000, in uh, July of 2015. So by my math, that's anywhere from 13 to 15 months of covering up this charade. So Rizwan left HCG in what I am allegedly told was a firing, but with, with a recommendation to go work at the great Equitable Bank, which I view as con which is, uh, Concordia 2.0. He claims in his LinkedIn things, which have since been pulled down or changed, that he contributed to 35% of the company's earnings. If something is not strange, why would this guy be leaving when all the fraud was discovered to go work at a competitor? In some of their disclosures in 2015, their numbers were wrong. I had a very good friend ask him a question on a conference call about the discrepancy of the numbers. And as you folks know, numbers are usually not wrong. They're usually proofed and gone over again and again and again. Um, those numbers aren't wrong. And they said it was a typo. That's, that's the amount of a typo for a bank. They knew about the mortgage fraud and still miss numbers using all sorts of excuses. And this is, can this is how Canada was booming. The CFO resigned in November 14, but remained on the board. The chief risk officer left unannounced with a replacement. A board member resigned in 2015. Bailey, who used to be the head of the OSC, resigned, I think, two days before HCG came clean. Management said they would replace him, but had a hard time in doing so. Here are some of the departures of 2016. Uh, there's twice as many who left in 2015. That fellow Joe Rosati, the VP of National Sales, they bragged on the conference call for about five minutes, I almost threw up, that they were bringing him in as the great white hope. I think he lasted there about eight months. Insider trading, not their first rolio. The guy who is the puppeteer, if you will, is Jerry Soloway. He is no longer there, but still on the board. He's been to this rodeo before where they promised not to sell stock in his prior company, but he shorted stock into a tender to buy it back through an issue of warrants. I can't make this crap up either. So with knowing full well that the mortgage fraud was going on, Insider sold an inordinate amount of stock in the back half of 14 and in early 15 at prices ranging from 54 to 43. Stock's now 27 in a straight up market. Management shared false information on many occasions. Uh, again, in the great handout that I have for you, this is all very well documented. Misstatements on conference calls and on why they were lowering their growth targets, but they never mentioned the mortgage fraud lowered ROE with various song and dance stories as well. A 
again, highlights that he says insurers will cover losses from fraud on the conference call. I've come to understand, and it's alleged, that of the fraudulent mortgages that HCG originated or originated under fictitious income or whatever the proper word is to use on this, it's alleged that they have securitized a vast portion of these into the Canadian uh, CMHC pools, which are insured by the Canadian government, hence the taxpayers. So if that's the case, and I'm going to send CMHC, which is their sort of Fannie Mae, I'm going to send the banking regulator copies of my slides after this as well. That, that to me, would be a significant insurance fraud that I think uh, needs to be exposed and uncovered. Here's what the Genworth insurance guy said. They're going to put through stress tests on these Canadian banks and home cap and equitable are the bottom feeders. I don't think they're going to pass the stress tests whatsoever. HCG is losing market share. That's no surprise. Equitable is gaining market share because they have the great Rizwan Kanishi there originating the loans. I mean, that, that, that poor rat bastard is going to start having a bad time, I'll tell you. And I've also alerted the regulators as to his whereabouts and what I think he's up to just for shits and giggles. <laughs> In Q4, Soloway said there was no uh, succession planning imminent. 18 days later, uh, it announces he's gone. I happen to believe and believe strongly that HCG is being staged by the banking regulator in Canada. I would love for them to deny it. In one of my handouts after this, it's the, um, it's the guidelines of banking um, Capture, insider selling at HCG, bought back stock on a Dutch tender to squeeze shorts at 37.80, it's now at 27, a real bad use of money. And then we have the Equitable Bank, which is running promotions like my dear friend Novastar. You know, this is for mortgage brokers to do business they shouldn't be doing, and you could win a great trip to Las Vegas. I guess Vegas is better than Toronto in the winter, but other than that, it's probably not. Here's the thing with Equitable. They have $1.2 billion of uninsured loan exposure in Alberta. That's 130% of book. How strong is Alberta? Here's Alberta's unemployment insurance claims and recipients in Alberta. It's back to 2009 levels. This chart's not updated. It's actually higher than that. There's housing inventory in Alberta. Housing starts in Alberta. Fewer jobs and more insolvencies. Alberta real estate has sure seen its better days. Dream, the REIT, blown up. Equitable Bank, there's their results on the stress test. I think their equity would be impaired by three quarters uh, at least. And what are their reserves on this whole deal? Their reserves are nil. They have a return on assets of 80 bips. 160 bips of provision wipes out one year's worth of earnings. I mean, just, just, just think of that for a minute. You have 130% of your equity in uninsured Alberta. Al Alberta is a complete shit show. And these guys, 160 bips of non-performers will wipe out their earnings. Texas banks you know, had 6% in the 80s. Those are the ones that made it. And that assumes all the loans are good, including the one that, re that Rizwan did. Management determined that this amount of provision would maintain our allowances at the appropriate level. That amount is nil. Their words, nil, included nil at the bottom. So they have 130% of their equity tied to uninsured Alberta, and their reserves are nil. Jim, that's as close to zero as I can get, right? Nil? I mean, that's like pill. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. A pal of mine went back and dug in in Texas in the 1980s, which wasn't a good thing, and that was very bad. I think 80 some odd percent went over. History doesn't repeat itself. So those are some of the US banks when they had a problem. It, it got quite bad 
And if we have that at either HCG or equitable, they're completely kaput. Oh, and don't worry. Alberta and Saskatchewan delinquencies are up 87% year over year. Early stage delinquencies up 122%. But don't worry, their reserves are nil. Yet provisions of loan losses are 0.00. You can't get lower than that. This chart didn't show up, but they're funding this, this floating, whatever you want to call it, crap game, to demand deposits, which make up short-term deposits make up 230% of equity. The greatest finance man I've ever known, Mike Farrell, said you always have to match your, your deposits, your assets against your liabilities, and these guys are completely mismatched. Sadly, that didn't show up. Seriously, don't look down, equitable. There you go. And my last thing I'm talking about, and there's a big handout, because this is sort of complex, and this is an example of bet the jockey, not the horse, is entertain. And I call this slide the web of evil. It was prepared by Todd Fernandez, who does brilliant work. Everyone in this slide, as it relates to entertain, to me, is a bad actor and a bad player. I always say, bet the jockey, not the horse. And these jockeys are all beyond sick. I get into it in the handout where these guys' bad connections are, and one's worse than the next. But entertain, why I say that's related to Learnout and Housebee, is they make money on an earnout through an unrelated company where I think costs are being put in one pocket to show profits in the next. I detail this greatly in the slides and the thing that I sent. So that's that. I want to allow some time for some questions. I went through this kind of fast, but I could have used a couple hours to get into some of this stuff. I think these handouts are really kind of uh, needle moving if, if you're interested in getting them or reading them. But any questions? Anyone have anything? Yes. Just a general question about Canada. Um, yeah. I look for value in Canada. Uh -huh. It's very hard to find. Uh -huh. um, what, what's, the, what's the environment there? Is the regulators just seem to be asleep on the job? There seems to be a lot of uh, cowboys in town. What, what, what's the background? And it's been going on for decades. Yeah, I think they have, we have a central SEC and a central regulator. Their regulators are all over the map, and I call it the alphabet soup bunch. They have something called OSFI. They have something called Fisco. They got CMHC. I think now with all the money laundering debate and this, that, and the other, they're starting to realize that when people's uh, shelter is 10 to 15 times their income, that they may have a problem. And I think they're, they moved and put some stuff in yesterday that could theoretically pop that bubble. If, you know, I can win on my bets on a credit event, a credit cycle, which I think is going to happen. I could win on specific companies, HCG and Equitable, when their um, bad deeds are uncovered or have to run through. There's a lot of ways to win there, but I don't think the status quo is going to remain status for long. Yes, sir. Thanks. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Where you usually or often start? What kinds of things you want to make sure you cover? And what are the typically confirming moments where you know you've got something? You know, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. It's not a one size fits all deal. Um, I look for stuff that doesn't fit and doesn't make sense. Too good to be true or why in the world would people do something like this? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of that out there. And again, I have a dear friend here today, and he doesn't want me to use his name because he's a little squirrely. But I, lo but I love you, Roland. I think you're, 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 I am so much better for knowing you. It's crazy. He calls me and he says, have you looked at XYZ? Let's just say Concordia. I said, yeah, I know what it is. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of that? I said, no, but this is a good point. I'll look into it. He, ma he makes me sharper. I try to talk to people who are, who are smarter than me, which really isn't that hard. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a highly educated guy. I mean, my grades were terrible. My second grade teacher thought I was going to end up in jail. But, but I, I don't take notes 
and I listen carefully, and when I see something that doesn't fit or doesn't stack right, I usually go at it pretty good. Anyone who threatens me or a name or a friend, I, I take off my clothes and I jump in the pool, especially if you threaten my wife. That's just not OK. Uh, Mark, we have a question from the World Wide Web audience uh, yeah. from Fernando. How do you time your shorts, which is to say, I guess, how do you how do you how do you trade around them? Do you press when they go down? Do you how do you do it? Yeah, that's a disease. I'm, I um, I always say I'm not the guy to climb in the tree and rustle the jaguar out of the tree. That's not me. I'll leave that to smarter. Like something like Tesla, that's not my speed. There are very smart people who are involved in Tesla, but that's not me. Maybe when Tesla's 90 and he can't get funding, maybe then I'll jump in. So I usually tend to wait, or think I can wait, for some form of break, some form of change. What jumped me on Concordia was when Valiant said they couldn't buy anymore and the prescription drug pricing thing changed. I knew their game was over. And they were so leveraged, I knew they couldn't come back from it. And they were run by complete dopes. So I try to wait for a break. And usually when things break, especially retail, if, if a retailer misses a quarter, they just don't miss one quarter. They tend to miss four. And they can blame weather, sukkahs, uh, you know, Christmas came in November, Thanksgiving didn't come in October, candy was tainted, the Super Bowl was a hit, it wasn't, you know, whatever bullshit there is. When you miss, because business is hard, when you miss and you're not a good operator and you have a bad balance sheet, that turns me on more than my wife. But, but that, 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 that gets me going. Yeah. Another question? Anyone? Yes, sir. Morning, Poisonton talked about the uh, federal budget, the off-balance sheet, uh, the off-balance sheet debt, uh, the the movement of of uh, expense items off of the uh, 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 budget, and so not using the word fraud there. How long can the government obfuscate what it's doing, and we continue to have confidence in its debt? Is this U.S. or Canada? U.S. Oh, I don't know. Lacey's on his worst day is 35 times smarter than me. I, I, you know, honestly, I don't even get into that stuff. I literally short five or six or seven stocks. I'm very, if I told you how big I was concentration wise in these things, you'd all vomit. But that's the way I do the reverse Druckenmiller. I think his way of managing money is brilliant, and that's what I try to do on the shorts. It's riskier than hell. I say, don't try it at home. People care about macro. I just find the shittiest, most made up, bad management balance sheet motherfuckers I can find, and I, and I go. And when I go, I go. And on some of these guys, like this Concordia guy, you're going to have to get a chain and put it around my neck to drag me off this carcass. Because, because seriously, I need, someone needs to make an example of picking on free speakers that this bullshit shouldn't go on. And I, right, I mean, right? And, and, and that before someone sues a skeptic next time, they'll say, look what happened to that poor rat bastard Thompson. Right? Look what happened to him. Don't sue the shorts. Talk to him civilly. See what happens and let it go. Let it go. Thank you, Jim.